Today's session is about your breath is your superpower. I will start off with the usual disclaimer. My presentation is not intended to provide medical advice. It is intended for informational purposes only. Please kindly note that I'm not from the medical field, but my research is based on the work of scientists and medical professionals. If you decide to make changes, it is best to consult with your GP. My presentation is based on my own experience and in no way implies that this is a universal cure, as I recognize that each individual is unique. I have no hidden agenda. I'm not making anything out of this. I'm just sharing some wisdom. Knowledge is power. Let us quickly recap what we covered last week. We took the topic sleep. So what does sleep deprivation do? It ages you faster. It blocks your brain's capacity for, for new learning. It results in cognitive decline. It makes you hyperactive and irrational. It shortens telomere length. It increases the possibility of heart attacks. Drops up to 70% in killer cells activities. And it also erodes your DNA genetic code. Sleep is not an optional lifestyle luxury. Sleep is non-negotiable biological necessity. It is a life support system. Sleep is the best way to restore your health. Never skip on sleep. It's crazy important. Breathing is the first thing that we do when we are born. And the last thing that we do before we die. Yet, most of us pay a little attention to it throughout our lives. I would love everybody here to simply stop breathing for the next few seconds. Don't take a big gulp in. Just exhale what you have got and let's hold it. Ready? Go. Keep going. Keep going. All right, let's breathe normally now. How did that feel? Did you feel that you could have done it much longer? Well, the truth is, if we had to hold our breath for another two, two and a half minutes, most of us, unfortunately, would have died. On average, the human body can go without food for about three weeks without water for three days, without air or without breathing, not even for three minutes. What is surprising is that when we go to try and improve our health, as most of us are doing perpetually on some level, we typically go first to the thing that we can do longest without, and that is food. Maybe soon after, we start pushing aside some of the sugary drinks and the junk food and start carrying around a big water bottle 
that we drink six to eight times a day. But we never start with something we can't go even without for one minute comfortably. Friends, we go on to the first poll question. And the first poll question is, on an average, how many breaths do we take every day? Is it 5,000? Is it 15,000? Is it 25,000? Or is it 35,000? So 8% said 15,000, 77% said 25,000, and 15% said 35,000. On an average, we breathe 25,000 times every day. By changing the way you breathe, you can change the way how your mind is processing thoughts, feelings, and emotions. We start off with a quote. Improper breathing is a common cause of ill health. Andrew Weil, an MD, says, if I had to limit my advice on healthier living, to just one tip, it would be simply to learn how to breathe correctly. There is no single more powerful or more simple daily practice to further your health and well being than breath work. By changing how we breathe, we can change how our mind processes thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Researchers who have studied breathing for 50 years say how we breathe absolutely affects us. It even affects the density of our bones. It, aff it affects us down to the atomic level subatomic level with electrons. We take in 30 pounds of air into our lungs and out of our lungs every single day. So if you think that the air and how we take in that air and how we expel it doesn't affect us, you are wrong. It affects us much more than food and you can eat all the right foods. You can exercise as much as you want, but if you are not breathing correctly, you are never ever going to be healthy. So once we take control of this unconscious ability to breathe, we can then harness all of the power within that to use it to do some incredible things. The first step about breathing is to be conscious of it and to understand that this isn't something we should just be running in the background, but something that we can and need to take control of. We are going to look at two very simple, healthy breathing habits, which are transformative. I'm not going to ask anyone to spare half an hour or an hour every day or to completely change their lifestyle. We are going to look at adopting healthy breathing habits, no matter what you are doing. First healthy breathing habit we are going to look at is how important it is to breathe through your nose. What goes on when something breathes through the, someone breathes through the nose compared to their mouth? So what are the benefits of nasal breathing? Humans are designed to breathe through, the, through our noses from birth. 
It's the way we have evolved. And there are reasons we default to nasal breathing. Inhaling through your nose offers many more benefits to the body than taking in air through your mouth. When we are newborns, we breathe in and out through our noses all the time. This is related to how our throats are configured. So we can breathe and suckle at the same time without choking. It is a survival mechanism. Our noses are also designed to process the air that comes in very differently than what our mouths can. These are intentional and functional parts of our body's design to keep us safe and healthy. Here are the good things that your nose does that your mouth doesn't when you breathe in. The first one is temperature control. Your lungs aren't huge fa you, your, your, your lungs aren't huge fans of air that's too hot or too cold. Unless you have an obstruction, your nasal passageways will warm and sometimes cool when needed the air to your lungs. Your mouth doesn't have a way to do this. For example, winter runners who breathe deeply through their noses get warmed air without sending a chill to their lungs versus those who breathe through their mouths. The second thing is filtering. The cilia in your nose Passage where filters out debris and toxins in the air and sends them directly down your throat instead of your lungs. Sounds gross, but intentionally better in the stomach than anywhere else. Mouth breathing sends whatever is in the air directly into your lungs. The third benefit is humidifying. The passages in your nose are specifically designed to humidify the air you breathe, something not present in your mouth. Ever wake up after a restless night's sleep with a dry mouth or a sore throat? Chances are you are fighting nature by mouth breathing and you are not getting the humidifying or moisture balancing benefits of nasal breathing. Fourth is smell. Using your smell, sense of smell through the olfactory system that's mostly present in the nose can help you detect harmful toxins in the air and in food. And the fifth benefit is 20% more oxygen. What happens when you close your mouth and you allow air to be pressurized, push the soft issues further back in the airway and open them up to breathe more eff efficiently? You get 20% more oxygen through a nasal breath than you do through a mouth breath. This will have tremendous effect on your health. The only time you really need to temporarily resist natural nasal breathing and engage in mouth breathing is when you are doing strenuous exercise and need more air to the lungs more quickly or when your nasal passage is blocked due to congestion, allergies or a cold. But remember, this does, however, cancel most of the benefits that breathing through your nose provides. When we breathe through our nose, we are humidifying the air, we are pressurizing the air, we are filtering the air, and we are conditioning it so that by the time that air gets to our lungs, it can more easily be absorbed and we can extract oxygen from it 
So we know that this is and has been proven time and again, and yet about 25 to 50% of the global population habitually mouth breathe. And when you mouth breathe, you get none of the benefits and you can think of the lungs as an external organ. When you are mouth breathing, you are exposed to everything in the environment. Then the question comes, what do we do when we sleep? And we tend to breathe through our, we tend to breathe through our mouths. This would mean that one third of our life, we are actually breathing through our mouths. I've been one of those mouth breathers for years. About two years ago, I started using a paper tape or a surgical tape, a micropore tape, a very tiny piece just to take my lips loosely. And it has worked wonders. It has improved my sleep. I feel very much rested when I wake up in the morning. My mouth is not dry anymore. I do not need to drink water at night. What the tape does is it forces you to breathe through your nose. If you do think of using it, please ensure that you can tolerate it. If unsure, please contact your GP. The quickest way of filtering air and conditioning it is this wondrous organ right in front of our faces called the mouth, called the nose. It is completely underappreciated and underused in society. Breathing affects your respiratory, cardiovascular, neurological, gastrointestinal, muscular, and psychic system, and also has a general effect on your sleep, memory, ability to concentrate, and your energy levels. This is what Donna Fari, an author and a yoga teacher says. We are going to do a small exercise now. All I want you to do is continue breathing normally as you are. All I want you to do is count the number of breaths that you take in one minute. I will tell you when to start counting and when to stop number of breaths you take in one minute. Please start counting now. is stop. So we go to our next poll question, which is how many breaths have you taken in one minute? So from the results, 8% said that they had six to nine breaths. A further 8% said 10 to 12, 46% said 13 to 15, and 38% said more than 16. This is quite important. And when we come towards the end of today's talk, you will understand why it is so important. And I will cover how we can change our breathing pattern to breathe less frequently 
can yet derive more benefits. Now, the second exercise that I would like everyone to do is, please place your right hand on your upper chest and left hand on your abdomen in your navel area and continue breathing normally. I repeat, place your right hand on your upper chest and your left hand on your abdomen in your navel area. Please continue breathing normally. We come to the next question. Are you a chest breather or a belly breather? So if your right hand rises more, you are a chest breather. And if your left hand rises more, then you are an, a belly breather. So are you a chest breather or are you a belly breather? So 33% of us are chest breathers and 67% of us are belly breathers. So I will, through this talk, also compare this with the number of breaths that we take. It has a, it has a important significance. And I will sh also share with you how we can all become belly breathers and what the benefits of being a belly breather are. Now just take a deep, you know, keep your hands again, right hand on your upper chest, left hand on your abdomen. Take a deep and full inhale and a slow, long exhale. Did you notice any change in your breathing? We are now going to cover chronic stress. So we have you know, two mechanisms. One mechanism is a fight or flight mechanism. And the, the other mechanism is rest and relax mechanism. So some of the common stress ailments, insomnia, difficulty falling asleep, difficulty digesting food, chronic fatigue, frequent infections, anxiety, depression, and the list goes on and on. Patients are given medicine as treatment and the symptoms go away on a temporary basis, but they always seem to resurface. We do not have a pill to treat the root cause and that is chronic stress. Let's pause for a minute and look at our interaction with our universe, which shares a little light on chronic stress right now. So you're all listening to me and your brain is either telling you, this is very interesting. Let's sit at the edge of the, air, of the chair and, and listen or it is telling you this is becoming boring, let's take a sleep right now. Before I said this, this was all happening on autopilot and you were not even aware of this interaction. So being aware of this interaction is the first step to understanding chronic stress. Let's assume we are in a forest and we see a lion or a tiger. When we see a lion or a tiger, the brain immediately starts sending dangerous signals to our body and the heart starts pounding faster. We can either run away from the danger or we can choose to stay there and fight the tiger. This is the fight or flight response. And remember, in this mode, all the non-essential functions of the body are shut down. There is no time or place 
for digestion, sleeping, growth, repair, or maintenance. In today's world, the tiger is replaced by project deadlines, exam, pandemic, the train being late, we caught up in traffic, or various things. In chronic stress, the tiger lives, but the perception of the tiger never leaves the body. Imagine we've had an argument with the boss or near and dear ones, and we have to face them again. What if I lose my job? What if my near and dear one is unhappy? What ifs and only ifs of regret are the tigers that never leave us. Our body was never meant to be to being in a danger mode for prolonged periods of time. So the question is, is chronic in chronic stress, is the problem the boss, the near and dear one, or really our own thought processes or our perception of the world. Dr. Stephen Porges did some amazing research into the vagus now. This is the now that is the throttle that can either turn on fight or flight functions in the body or make us relax. And this nerve is connected to all our organs. So he kept seeing patients that, do, that would have various problems like digestion problems, sleep problems, kidney problems, and they were treated for each of these problems individually. But there was nothing wrong with their stomachs or any other organs. What they had were connectivity with the vagus nerve problems because they were constantly stressed. So by being in this state of constant stress, all the signals that those organs normally send to the brain were cut off. So by fixing this vagus now, connectivity, specifically through breathing practices, through calming practices, all those organs start functioning and all the problems go away. So when you, when the important thing now to remember is we inhale and we exhale. Inhale needs to be a full, deep inhale. And the exhale needs to be a longer exhale, a few counts longer than your inhale. So what he says is, when your exhale is even a few counts longer than your inhale, the vagus now sends a signal to your brain to turn up your parasympathetic nervous system and turn down your sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system commands your fight or flight response. When it fires, your heart rate and your breathing speed up and stress hormones like cortisol start pumping through your bloodstream, preparing your body to face a threat. The parasympathetic system, on the other hand, controls your rest, relax, and digest response. When the parasympathetic system is dominant, your breathing slows, your heart rate drops, your blood pressure lowers, and your body is guided back into a state of calm and healing. Putting your body into a parasympathetic state is easier than you might think. It just takes a slight manipulation of the breath. We will now look at the benefits of a deep, full inhale and a slow, long exhale. A good quote, it is biologically impossible to have an anxiety or panic attack when you are breathing fully, deeply, slowly. You can't do it. So let's look at the benefits of belly breathing. It detoxifies and releases toxins. 
your body is designed to release 70% of its toxins through breathing. If you are not breathing effectively, you are not properly reading your body of its toxins. That is, other systems in the body will need to work over time, which could lead to more illness. When you exhale air, air from your body, you release carbon dioxide that has been passed through from your bloodstream into your lungs. Carbon dioxide is a natural waste of the body's mechanism. Deep breathing releases tension. Think how your body feels when you are tense, angry, scared, or stressed. It constricts, your muscles get tight, and your breathing becomes shallow. When your breathing is shallow, you are not getting the amount of oxygen that your body needs. It relieves pain. You may not realize the connection to how you think, feel, and experience life. For example, what happens to your breathing when you anticipate pain? You probably hold your breath. Yet studies show that breathing into your pain helps to ease it. The fourth thing is it massages your organs. The movement of the diaphragm during deep breathing exercise massages the stomach, the small intestine, liver, and pancreas. The upper movement of the diaphragm also massages the heart. When you inhale air, your diaphragm descends and your abdomen will expand. By this massage, by this action, you massage your vital organs and improve circulation in them. Controlled breathing also strengthens and tones your abdominal muscles. And it also strengthens the immune system. Oxygen travels throughout the bloodstream by attaching to hemoglobin in your red blood cells. This in turn enriches your body to metabolize nutrients and vitamins. The sixth benefit is it improves the nervous system. The brain, spinal cord, and nerves received increased oxygenation and are more nourished. This improves the health of the whole body since the nervous system communicates to all parts of the body. As you breathe deeply, the lung becomes more healthy and powerful, a good insurance against respiratory problems. It makes the heart stronger. Breathing exercises reduce the workload on the heart in two ways. First, deep breathing leads to more efficient lungs, which means more oxygen is brought into contact with the blood sent to the lungs by the heart. So the heart doesn't have to work as hard to deliver oxygen to the tissues. Secondly, Deep breathing leads to greater pressure differential in the lungs, which leads to an increase in circulation, thus resting the heart a little. Then it reduces inflammation. Diseases like cancer only thrive in bodies that are acidic in nature. Deep breathing is said to reduce the acidity in your body thereafter, therefore making it alkaline. It stimulates the lymphatic system. As our breathing is what moves the lymph, shallow breathing can lead to a sluggish lymphatic system which will not detoxify properly. Deep breathing will help you get the lymph flowing properly so that your body can work more efficiently. So, Many of us breathe way too much. By slowing down the breathing in line with our metabolic needs, you'd be surprised what a transformative effect that will have on your health. And you can breathe this way while you're watching TV, while, while you're driving at the dinner table, whenever you want to start with a few minutes and start developing this, and hopefully it will become a habit. First, we need to acclimatize the body to doing this new form of breathing, which will then become a natural, healthy form of breathing, which we have all forgotten. We now come to pranayama. 
What does pranayam mean? So pran means life force. It's literally in the air we breathe. It's all around us. And what does ayam mean? Ayam means extension or expansion. So literally, pranayam means longevity through breathing. Now let's look at some statistics of various mammals and how many breaths they take per minute compared to how long they live. So the mouse breathes about 130 times per minute, yet it lives for only three years. The dog breathes for 30 times a minute, and it lives for about 15 years. The chimpanzee breathes 14 times a minute, and it lives for 40 years. The horse breathes 12 times a minute, and it lives for 50 years. Human on an average, healthy humans breathe nine times a minute, and they live on an average 77 years. The whale breathes only six times a minute, and it lives for 100 years. Longevity is to a certain extent linked with how many breaths we take per minute. And to look at this from a spiritual perspective, being aware of your breath forces you into the present moment, which is the key to all inner transformation. Whenever you are conscious of your breath, you are absolutely present. You may also notice that you cannot think and be aware of your breath. Conscious breathing stops your mind. This is from Eckhart Tolle. So in summary, the breath is always with us. It is the most effective calming tool and it's free. The secret of life is right under your nose. Breathe, let go, and remind yourself that this very moment is the only one you know you have for sure, Oprah Winfrey. What does James Nestor say? No matter what we eat, how much we exercise, how resilient our genes are, how skinny or young or wise we are, none of it will matter unless we are breathing correctly. And the final two simple things that we've learned today, the nose is for breathing and the mouth is for eating. A deep, full inhale, slow, long exhale. This is the key to longevity. This was session six. In the first three sessions, we covered the introduction, we covered fasting, and we covered fisting. The next three sessions, we covered the mind, which is meditation, sleep, and breathing. And our session seven is all about moving more. Move more to live more. Thank you, everyone.